Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the third in our science lecture series this, uh, this spring on the science of food and health. My name is Mary Lynn Yates, and I'm the Dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. And we, along with the UC Global Food Initiative and our new institute called California Agriculture and Food Enterprise, are really pleased to sponsor this lecture series. Tonight we have a couple of special guests with us. Um, Chancellor Kim Wilcox is here with us this evening. And our Vice Chancellor for Planning and Budget, Maria Anguiano, is also here with us. So, um, yeah. Um, you are in for a real treat tonight. We didn't advertise this, but you are going to learn a lot about what we're doing here at UCR, not we, that's the royal we, what some people here at UCR are doing to really try to bring more sustainably grown and healthy foods into our menus uh, that, that our students eat. And you're not only going to hear about these things, but afterwards, after the Q&A session, you'll actually get to taste some of these foods. So I hope everybody's hungry. So we have two speakers with us this evening, and I'm going to introduce both of them to start with. And that will be um, Cheryl Garner. She will be our first speaker. And she has been the executive director of dining, conference, and catering services here at UCR for the last six years. She oversees almost everything food at UCR, including our campus residential restaurants, our retail restaurants, our campus food trucks. In case you didn't know, we actually have food trucks on campus that, are, that tend to be very, very brightly colored. Um, our campus convenience stores and the Office of Catering, Conference, and Event Services. Now, in addition to doing things at the UCR campus related to food, she's also involved nationally in a couple of different food initiatives. She is the Education Chair for the National Association of College and Universities Food Services, as well as a member of the Executive Committee for the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. Um, Cheryl has been for uh, more than 20 years in college and university food service uh, at UCLA, University of San Diego, Texas A&M, and then, of course, BEST UCR. Our second speaker will be Dr. Neil Malik. Neil is a registered dietitian here at UCR, and he has both doctor's and master's degrees from Loma Linda University with an emphasis in chronic disease prevention and nutrition. He's also a certified health fitness specialist, so you can ask him about that afterwards. And his research experience includes weight management and type 2 diabetes. He's worked as a lifestyle educator for Kaiser Permanente and has been a college instructor for the last eight years. So at this time, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Cheryl Garner to the stage. Well, good evening. I'm really excited to spend tonight and talk to you about some of the great sustainability programs that we've developed at the dining department at uh, University of California, Riverside. But more importantly, I'm super excited to explain to you our bold new initiative, The Seeds of Change. So I know there are many, many definitions of sustainability, and there are probably even more debates on what is truly sustainable. But I particularly like this definition because maybe I'm old fashioned. I think it was actually written in the 80s. Um, but it's, it's pretty simple. And what it is, is it says at its core, sustainable development means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. So why is the decisions that we make in restaurants and in college food service important to sustainability? Well, first of all, 40% of all arable land is used for growing food. And 40% of our water is used for food. 42% of our global export is food. And 30% of the greenhouse gases that are created comes from the growth of food. So let's take a quick look at the impact that our need for food has created over the, over the planet in the last 300 years. 
And these charts actually so show the percent of land used for growing crops to feed the world's population. And as you see dark blue, then red, then orange, then yellow, you're really actually seeing areas where they're moving to the 60 to 100 percent saturation level in terms of growth of food. So we're going to start in the 1700s. This is around the time of the Salem witch um, trials. We're moving to 1750. You'll see it's still mostly blue, so we haven't really hit any major saturation. Part of that is the population. This is about the time Ben Franklin discovered electricity. By 1800, about the time that Lewis and Clark expedition occurred and the Louisiana Purchase, you're starting to see some darkening blue. Now we're getting around the 60% saturation point in a couple of areas. And by 1850, the start of events leading up to the Civil War, and just after the beginning of the gold rush, for the first time you're starting to see some areas where we're moving more towards the 60 and 80%. By 1900, when my grandparents were born, and Ford Motors was formulated, and President McKinley was assassinated, you're starting to see that we're moving into the 80% level, and just a few peaks of areas that have really started to be saturated with the growth of crops. By 1950, when I was born, I'm not telling you when that was exactly, <laughs> and about the time of the Korean War, we're starting to see that there are actually areas that for the first time are hitting 100%. And by the year 2000, just a year before 9-11, you can see that we have hit some major saturation points in the world in terms of the amount of land being used to grow food. So clearly, food and menu choices impact not only our personal health, but they also impact the health of our planet. And more and more, environmental imperatives and nutrition are beginning to converge. And I propose that in many, many ways, the recipe choices that we make in restaurants actually are very significant to farm and to what's, what's grown. Because at the end of the day, it's the choices that we choose to put in our restaurants that actually become the foods that we grow. And last year, while attending a program at the Culinary Institute of America, sorry, I heard a really interesting quote. The quote came from Craig McNamara, who is the president of the California State Board of Food and Agriculture and an actual owner of a farm himself. And what he said is that if we are not able to increase crop production by 70%, that by the year 2050, we will no longer be able to feed the population of the world. And that really hit me. It was so meaningful. I probably won't see it in my lifetime, but as I thought about my two boys and my grandchildren, I thought, we have got to do something different because this is just clearly not going to work. So we have to change the way that we do business. And for this reason, the University of California system initiated action plans and goals around sustainability. And the initial pol policy around sustainable practices was drafted about 2003. And it was done at the request of students. So you ask yourself, what can dining services do? The guiding principles that we utilize as we focus on sustainability and on sustainable programming, operational development, sourcing and procurement, and menu development are derived from a compilation of many goals and initiatives. The UC Global Food Initiative, this was launched by um, our UC president, Janet Napolitano, and, and was actually signed and agreed upon by our 10 UC uh, chancellors, was meant to align research and outreach and operations in a sustained effort to develop, demonstrate, and export solutions, not only through California, not only through the U.S., but across the world for food security, health, and sustainability. And it draws on the leadership in agriculture and medicine, nutrition, and climate science, and policy, and social science, biological science, humanities, arts, and law, among others. 
And for our dining operations, it leverages the UC collective buying power and dining practices to create desirable practices and outcomes. The UC Office of the President 2020 Food Initiative and Sustainability Goals had nine complementary and interconnected areas of environmental interest, including food, but also climate and recycling and waste management and environmentally friendly procurement, water conservation, and also built environments. And of course, we have our own UC Riverside Sustainability Goals, a kind of a more localized version of that larger initiative. And menus of change, as established by the Culinary Institute of America and the Harvard School of Public Health. And then what I think we do in the department is we add our own unique understanding of the culinary wants and desires of our faculty, staff, and students, and a keen understanding of our own operations. So this is our vision, and it's taken from the Menus of Change initiative developed by the CIA and also by the uh, Harvard Public School of Health. I believe it does a really great job of demonstrating a perfect model for what dining services and restaurants should be. It shows a balanced focus on being environmentally sustainable, socially responsible and ethical, nutritious and healthy, but Above all, it recognizes if our food is not delicious, if it doesn't taste excellent, no one's going to want to eat it. And so it has, to, it has to be all those things, and it has to be, have both cultural and culinary appeal and relevance. So based on all those principles, we decided that we really wanted to take a stab at the big initiative. And we launched this program in winter, and it will continue to be a major initiative, a culinary focus, an education program, and a marketing endeavor for the department for the foreseeable future. It recognizes that we, in a very unique way, in a very unique position on college and university campuses, um, uh, can do something really significant. We have many students who are just beginning to make decisions and choices about where they're going to purchase, what they're going to purchase, how they're going to cook, and how they're going to eat. And these decisions will often remain with them as they become parents and as they become adult decision makers. And they will influence their health and also the health of our environment going forward. So I don't want to, to ruin your eyes trying to look at this chart. It's really just meant to show you that there's 24 principles and that they really span from concepts and general operations to foods and ingredients. And it's important to note that Dining Services has not hit all these goals yet. But we are committed to it. We're committed to working through each and adjusting our programs, our products, and our offerings to make them a reality. I'm going to run quickly through the 24 elements starting with the first 10 menu concepts and general operations. And I'd also like to share you some of the progress that we've already made, because I think we've made some major moves. Transparency is key. Whether it's sharing our calories and our nutrition on how our food, or how our food was produced, people want and need to know about their food. And there's nothing better than fresh from the field produce. And this can happen if we source locally and we source seasonally. We need to ask our vendors about their practices and sustainability programs. And then we need to reward with our business when they meet our vision. We need more in menu innovation around plant-based <coughs> cooking to increase the consumption of plant-centric foods and to move away from being an animal food culture. We need whole, minimally processed foods. They're great, but we also need to recognize that there's some healthy processed foods as well. And we need not to throw out our traditions. That's not what we're actually looking at. We need to honor those traditions and those special occasion foods 
but also grow some everyday options that include nutritious, delicious, sustainable choices. We need to create inspiring menu items that are so delicious and so full of flavor that the fact that they're healthy and that they're sustainable is really secondary. We call this stealth health. It leads, what it means is we lead with really great food and the nutrition just comes along with it. We need to make portions the right size. You know what, restaurants do not have to cut their profits. They just need to move from the value proposition being size to the value proposition being quality. We need to savor our food heritage, but we also need to take those less healthy and limit their frequency or their portion size and re-image them in a healthy way. And we need to design our operations and eating spaces to support goals of healthy, sustainable choices. So what have we done? We launched a new website this last week. Most of our food nutrition information is posted and there's a calculator in there so that you can actually go in and, and put the nutritional information for your entire meal. And Neil's going to show you a little bit about this later. We reduced our napkin usage by 50%. You know, you can make such simple changes that have impact. All we did was take and put our napkins on the table. People didn't have to grab a handful anymore. We educate and we celebrate Food Day, Earth Week in a big way with nutrition classes, introductions to good for you foods like kale, and sampling foods that ju just demonstrate how wonderful produce can be. For example, we do vegetarian tacos on our food truck, the Culinary Chameleon. 25% of our purchased products, excuse me, 15% of our purchased products meet the UCOP sustainable goals. We're trying to get to 20 by the year 2020. We specify and purchase Energy Star food equipment for our operations. And we use a food dehydrator in Lothian our residential restaurant where we actually take food waste and we dehydrate it and then that food waste is actually shipped over to the R garden and they use it as an amendment for the soil. It's really rich in nutrients. Bunnies and small animals like it too. <laughs> we use cage free eggs and we have since 2011. We compost more than 250 tons of food waste annually eliminating much of the solid waste from landfills and generating valuable so soil amendments. We recycle 100% of our cooking oil, which is used for, among other things, biodiesel fuel. Through social engineering, we reduce both food waste and our residents' waste lines. First, we eliminated trays and in our residential restaurants, and then we scaled down the plate size. We save thousands of paper cups every year because we give a discount if you bring your own. And approximately 95% of our packaging within all of our restaurants is compostable, including our Pepsi cups. This is a picture of a tiny little village in Humetepeca in Guatemala. The villagers carry these jugs, sometimes miles, to a single water faucet that is open and operating for three hours a day. This is their entire water supply. As part of a social responsibility program, Dining Services developed an alliance with Java City Coffee to give back 15 cents on every pound of coffee that we purchased. And Java City matched our donation. And then they went after importers and exporters to get them to match our donation. So now, with 60 cents a pound for every pound that we purchase. We have um, received those commitments and we have raised more than $120,000 for this village. And our project has actually started. It allows the farmers to harvest, filter, and store groundwater at home and it eliminates miles of distance that they had to travel in the past carrying these jugs to bring the water back to their homes and their villages and we expect this project to complete in five years. 
Java City supplies us with fair trade, bird friendly, organic, and creates our Highlander blend. This is our executive chef, Lynette Dickerson, our senior director, David Henry, and the co-president of the UCR chapter of Swipes for the Homeless, Rafid Sitker. And they're at our first delivery of approximately 4,000 pounds of groceries that, and products that went to Feeding America. We worked for two years with Rafid and Lakan Gandhi, two of the most fabulous UCR students you will ever meet, to bring this program to fruition. And during the 10th week of each quarter, students can sign away some of their unused meal swipes so that the money can be used to purchase food, which is then delivered to Feeding America. And we also spent some of the money to help them plant vegetables in the UCR, our garden, which when harvested will be brought back to local food banks or in the future we hope will go to our own UCR food pantry. We donate thousands of products and thousands of pounds of surplus leftover food to River, Riverside County's Inland Harvest. Last year alone we donated 19,000 pounds of food and some of it went to support our own UCR students. For example, St. George's Episcopal Church has a student night every Thursday night, which receives some of the food and services, as you might guess, mostly UCR students. And we heard a really startling fact the other day from Daniel Lopez, a UCR student who received a fellowship from our UCR Global Food Initiative team to do research on food security issues and who is specifically focused on creating a food pantry. He did a survey and he said that in, in 2014, approximately 18% of our students chose to skip a meal often or very often because they were unable to afford it. I also want to mention that all UCR, act, uh, that UCR active minds in collaboration with the well and case managers have taken a lead role in coordinating a hunger awareness campaign called Change for Change at all of our retail dining facilities to raise money to support student food needs. So in conjunction with UCR Workplace Health and Wellness and the Global Food Initiative team and Old Grove Orange Farm Share, we launched a UCR Farm Share in our new market at Glenmore, our Lead Gold residential building. Old Grove Farm Share is the group providing the produce and it's made up of local farmers from areas like Riverside and Redlands and Hemet and Chino and other communities. And Bob Knight, we call him Farmer Bob, has a citrus farm involved um, in, in Redlands. And he said that he decided to do this out of desperation. He was trying to figure out a new way to keep business going. So instead of depending on global distributors, he now goes directly to the community. community. We have almost 100 people signed up for our farm share. So now let's talk about the other 14 food and ingredient goals of the Seeds of Change principles. Think produce first. I promise you we are not trying to make you all vegan and vegetarian. Just start moving towards proteins as an ingredient or as a condiment. We will be serving you a few of these today. Um, we're going to give you a terrific gazpacho made from local vegetables at the end of the presentation today. And make whole grains the new norm. They're so incredibly much better for you. We want to limit potatoes as your plate filler. Try mixing them in with some non-starchy vegetables or just having them less frequently. And an excellent alternative source for protein we're going to move nuts and legumes to the center of the plate. They add incredible flavor and they're very, very satiating. We want everyone to choose healthier plant-based oils such as soy and canola and olive oil and peanut oil. We already have done this. They're the healthy oils, the ones with unsaturated fats, and they also want you to avoid trans fats. One of the things we're going to give you is a taste of a watermelon and feta salad. 
It's made with fig and vanilla vinegar, olive oil, that comes from our local Temecula Olive Oil Company. And there are beneficial fats that are associated with positive nutrition and healthy weight. So we need, finally, to end the low-fat myth. An added benefit of some of these positive beneficial fats is that they improve the taste of our food and make ingredients like vegetables that much more stellar to eat. We were going to see, serve more seafood more often, and not just the top seven, eight varieties that we're beginning to deplete from our oceans. Once called trash fish, there is a huge variety of delicious seafood just waiting for chefs to take and, and show you all how incredible it can be and create that next new fad. And we're going to try and limit the servings of dairy to one or two servings a day. We love our cheese, but we can leverage that same flavor in smaller doses. And we can use butter as a seasoning and a food enhancer. enhancer. Because they're healthier options and have a smaller environmental impact, we're going to continue to focus on poultry and eggs, but in moderation. And we're going to use red meat in a supporting role. Try it as a condiment, as an ingredient, or mix it with vegetables. We're going to sample you today at the end of the session a mixture of 40% mushroom and grass-fed beef, and I guarantee you it is so tasty. You know, you're going to love it, and as your mom said, you at least got to try it. Use fruits and nuts and even dark chocolate and reduce your added sugar instead of that slab of cheesecake with a big spoonful of strawberries on top. We're proposing that we might flip that equation. We might have a delicious serving of strawberries with a sprinkle of cheesecake crumbles on top. We have a sample of that for you today, too. And there is a whole new world of spices out there herbs, citrus, and aromatics that can replace salt. It is truly the wonderful thing about ethnic cuisines. They have introduced us to those seasonings, those aromatics, and those sauces that really make a difference, and we don't have to use salt anymore. And great beverages don't have to have sugar. Spa waters are hugely popular in our residential facilities. Their favorite is the strawberry banana. We can't even keep it stocked. And we have some samples of that for you today, too. A watermelon basil, spa water, and a UCR citrus mint. And drink water. It's good for you. It's good when it's enhanced with flavorings. Plain tea and coffee aren't bad for you either. And the good news, even beer and wines and spirits in moderation are not that bad for you, with a few caveats. So what have we accomplished in the food and ingredient area? We have less meat Mondays in residential dining and beefless Fridays. Between 33 and 50 percent of our produce is local, and you can taste it. It's so much different when it hasn't gone through all that travel and all that refrigeration. In conjunction with the campus wellness team, we launched a healthy menu guide. We created a healthy eating guide to the Highlander Union. Vegan and vegetarian options are offered at every meal. And it, in last year alone, 25% of all the food that we sold was vegan or vegetarian. I think that's rather amazing. We have a Marine Stewardship Council Monterey Bay Aquarium approved sustainable sa salmon and a free range, hormone free, chicken coming in this month. We utilize small batch cooking. It allows us to have really great fresh product and also not to have waste. And we use UCR oranges that we get from our own orchards to make our fresh squeezed orange juice each and every day throughout all of our operations. And in residential, there's a machine in there that students can come in and squeeze their own each morning. We've developed a guide to vegan and vegetarian uh, options at UCR. And we use only healthy plant-based oils, the good ones, like soy and olive and canola. 
even for french fries. And our house baked items are all trans fat free. We worked with Fortina Morales, who oversees our UCR our garden, um, our community garden, and is able to so he is now able to supply us with fresh produce. So we buy his produce from the R garden for residential dining, which provides us the most, absolutely most local food possible, and helps support their program. And this winter on Earth Day, we launched the first of the 24 principles of our Seeds of Change program. One part education, one part marketing, but mostly an operational and culinary commitment. The program has the, my culinary team and my purchasing team busy making sure that we walk our talk. We have infused our operations with more produce-centric options and continue to add them monthly. Next up, our next campaign, our next focus is reduction of sugary beverages and new beverage innovations. And now I want to invite Dr. Neil Malik up, and he's going to talk a little bit about health and nutrition. Good evening, everyone. So I want to discuss my roles on campus as a registered dietitian, as well as some of the future initiatives we're going to roll uh, with Seeds of Change. So going back to our vision, I'm going to focus specifically on these two sections in particular. How do we provide nutritious and healthy food here on campus? How do we keep it delicious with both culinary and cultural appeal? So my roles. As the registered dietitian for the campus, I'm the nutrition resource. Uh, part of my duties include one-on-one -on -one consultations for faculty, staff, and students. So if someone wants personalized nutrition information, they would see me. I also assist those with uh, special dietary needs. I ensure that the nutrition and allergen information that we have is not only available, but is also accurate. And I provide general nutrition education for the campus as a whole. So this screenshot that you see here is actually taken from our UCR uh, Dining Facebook page. And students send me questions. The question for this one was, what are some brain foods you'd recommend for midterms and finals? <laughs> it's a common one. And so uh, I reply to these questions with a 15 second video which gets posted on our UCR Facebook site. So uh, that's just some of the general nutrition education I provide. I also assist with campus wellness programs and uh, not necessarily wellness related programs but just campus and community programs in general. So Cheryl mentioned one of the initiatives with Seeds of Change is to be more transparent. We believe that with regards to nutrition information and posting allergen information, that that's a big component to being transparent. And so if you actually go to our brand new beautiful dining.ucr.edu website, you will see our campus restaurants posted there. So if you click on the left column here, you click on campus restaurants, it'll pull up a, uh, a menu just like this. And you'll see our restaurants pop up. If you click on, click on any one of them, let's say the barn, it'll take you to the barn's website, or it'll take you to any campus's, campus restaurant website. There you can see the menu, and you can see the nutrition information by clicking one of these buttons. When you click one of those buttons, something like this will pop up. You can click on any one of these items, and it will then take you to the nutrition facts. So it looks similar to what you would see on a food label. And you'll notice that uh, we also post allergen information there as well. But let's say this is what you're looking at here is the Chinese apple, um, apple salad. Let's say you didn't just have the salad for lunch. You had a soup as well. We actually have the ability to do the calculations for you, so you don't have to do the math yourselves. If you want to know how many calories you consumed at lunch, how many total grams of fat, saturated fat, etc., our website will do that for you. And with regards to food allergies, with the help of our marketing team, we created some icons to help identify the major food allergens, as well as a vegan icon, a vegetarian icon, a gluten-free icon, as well as one for items that contain beef and or pork. We also have a gluten-free kitchen at our Aberdeen Inver Inverness uh, residential restaurant. 
It's only available to those with celiac disease, so they have to have a uh, diagnosed condition, but really that's, for, that's to prevent any cross-contamination. Our culinary team is also trained using the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis uh, Network Guidelines, and our management team is also certified. Now Cheryl mentioned a lot of the initiatives with regards to seeds of change are surround eating more nutritious, healthy foods. But we all know that it's easier said than done. As a dietitian, when I meet with folks, I'll recommend, of course, that they should eat more fruits and vegetables. That's fairly common. And they'll say, yeah, I already knew that. Tell me something I don't know. We know that knowledge is power, but behavior is even more powerful. But sometimes knowledge doesn't translate to behavior. So Cheryl mentioned the term stealth health. That's something that we're trying to incorporate. We believe that health is about conscious design, and there's a lot of research being done with this. Here what you're looking at is your standard grocery store cereal aisle. Where might you find the healthier, quote unquote, or more nutritious cereals? Have you ever really paid attention? They're usually at the top. Or some of the decent ones, ones that I'm not crazy about but I'll tolerate, are the bottom. But what do we find right at, for most adults, right at waist height? The cereals that I like us to think of as desserts. But these are the ones that little Sally or Susie, when she bounces down the aisle, tends to see first. So the question is, does that really impact buying and eating behaviors? And we're finding that it does. It doesn't just apply to children. Researchers have looked at vending machine purchases on college campuses. Which item tends to sell the fastest? This one, the one you see right at eye level in the center. And researchers swapped a bunch of different foods and they found that consistently, whether it was low calorie, high calorie, or modest in calories, if it was in the center, it was purchased three times more often. So quite a bit of health can be simply about conscious design. But we also want to pay attention to what our customers want. And the trend right now is customizable meals. Subway, of course, has had that market for a long time. But now other restaurants are catching on. So now there's Witch Witch, which is also a, a uh, sandwich chain, which provides higher quality ingredients, they say. Quiznos we know about, also the same concept. But now pizza chains are getting involved, too. Blaze Pizza, which is the image you see here, for one flat price, you can get all the toppings you want. You tell them how much of each you want on it. Pyology, same concept. Uh, Chipotle, which many of you are probably familiar with. It's Latin or Mexican inspired cuisine and it's like Subway for Mexican food. Uh, you can tell them how much you want of each item. Uh, the Counter Burger, Fuddruckers, so even burger chains are getting involved in this. And this is what our students, what our customers want. They want customizable meals like this. So our question is, can we position our menus in such a way to promote health and, and provide the customer what they want? Customization. We believe there is. We believe there's a union there. So we want to allow the freedom of choice without forcing the health issue. Because we know if we force health upon our customers, they're going to put up that wall and they're going to turn away. So I want to repeat this. We are not removing french fries from our restaurants <laughs> or our chicken fingers. We will keep those. We, we want the freedom of choice. But what we want to do is allow for more options nutritious options should folks want those. So we want to make the healthy choice the easy choice. Incorporate stealth health. And in fact, currently we offer, for example, whole grain options throughout campus. So if someone wanted, if they go to Habaneros at the Highlander Union building and they wanted brown rice, it's available. If they want whole wheat pasta at La Fiamma, it's available. We also have a 21 topping salad bar within our uh, residential restaurants. La Fiamma, I just mentioned that, they have whole wheat pasta, but they also have a salad platform where animal proteins are more like a condiment. They're added for flavor, but the base of it is produce. And the barn has a lighten up menu. Uh, the lighten up menu meets the California Department of Public Health's uh, healthy entree guidelines for calories and fat. And that has actually been received very, very well. And in fact, I was tasked with, because the lighten up menu was received so well, I was tasked with creating some more nutritional guardrails for some of our other restaurants. 
And this is what I created. I adapted the American Heart Association guidelines, but the goal here is to have at least one of our entrees each day and each platform meet these guardrails. So I've been working with our chefs, and they've been working really hard to create entrees that meet these goals. So for calories, I say 700 calories max per entree per serving. Why, how did I get that number? Well, if we take the average calorie requirement for most healthy adults, it's between 2,000 and 2,400 calories a day. Divide that by three, meaning three meals a day, and you get about 700 calories. So that's where we got that number. Saturated fat, the current recommendations, the current guidelines still state that 10%, no more than 10% of our calories should come from saturated fat. So when we do the math, if we use this as our calorie requirement, 700 times 10%, if you convert that into grams, which is how we measure saturated fat. If you look on a nutri nutrition label, you'll see saturated fats measured in grams. That basically means no more than eight grams of saturated fat per serving. Trans fat, we've eliminated those, as Cheryl mentioned. Uh, even the oils we use for frying have, are, have zero grams of trans fat in them. Uh, and we know we want to do that because trans fat's been associated, it's been linked with many, many chronic diseases. So zero grams max is the requirement there. Sodium, sodium's a tricky one. We know that salt makes things taste better. We know that it's difficult to remove salt from a lot of foods. So I said 1,000 milligrams per entree maximum. If we can meet that goal, I'd be pretty happy. How did I figure that? Currently, the guidelines still stand at 2,300 milligrams per day for most people, which if you look at the tip of your finger, it's, imagine you put salt on the tip of your finger, that's 2,300 milligrams. It's not that much. So I said, okay, let's divide that by three for three meals per day, and you get 770 milligrams. That's a really specific number, and I want to give our chefs a little bit more leeway and a little bit more time to maybe cut some of the salt back. So I rounded up and said 1,000 milligrams max. Fiber. Most of us don't get enough fiber each day. So this is actually a minimum. Uh, most adults should get 25 grams of fiber per day. We measure it in grams. 25 divided by three is roughly eight grams. So these are some of the nutritional guardrails that I'm help, helping to develop and helping our chefs kind of maintain as their goals. Also, we wanna keep whole foods in our minds. We don't wanna forget that we don't need to just always focus on these numbers. These are nice, it keeps us on track, but when we look down at our plates, we should also see at least one serving of dark green, orange, or red vegetable. We also wanna see one whole grain and a lean protein. And these are very much in line with some of the Seeds of Change initiatives that Cheryl mentioned. We also wanna emphasize the use of herbs, onion, garlic, some of those aromatics from other cultures to reduce the salt. So we thought the nutrition information, those nutritional guardrails are nice, but how many folks, how many of our customers are actually gonna go there and try and calculate all their calories for the day, all their grams of saturated fat, their sodium? Can we simplify it? So this is more of a behind the scenes approach, but what about our customers? How will they know whether they're on track? We decided to implement and to adopt USDA's My Plate campaign. It's basically, you take your five food groups, you look at it using a familiar setting, a place setting at a table, and by looking down at the plate, or your cup or your bowl, you can hopefully determine whether you're on the right track with regards to your portions and balance. So why My Plate? Well, according to the Harvard School of Public Health, a diet reasonable in portions and full of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains may prevent many chronic diseases, and My Plate provides that, portion and variety. Researchers are also discovering that many consumers have difficulty with portion control. And when we think about the university campus, many students, it's their first time away from home, they're on their own, they're responsible for their own meals, and we felt that there was, there was a nice piece where we can educate, where we can provide some of that education and show them portion and balance. So if we look carefully at this plate, if we dissect it a little bit, we can see half the plate should consist of fruits and vegetables. A little more than a quarter should contain a grain and preferably a whole intact grain. A little less than a quarter should contain a lean protein and then dairy in moderation and more in a supporting role. One of the questions I get a lot is, how big is this plate? How big of a plate do I get? 
I'm going to give you a hint. It's not this one. It's not this IHOP size plate. It's not the Olive Garden or Claim Jumper size plate either. Really, what they're talking about is your standard paper plate, which is nine inches in diameter. And luckily, within our residential restaurants, uh, a couple years ago, we actually implemented, not paper plates, but this size plate, nine inches in diameter. I'm going to take a quick tangent and talk about how just the combination of using those smaller plates, along with trailless dining that Cheryl mentioned, we've actually decreased our uh, food waste by 50% and reduced our water usage by 1 million gallons since 2008. So this is a nice little sustainability piece in addition to the education piece. So we also thought about, okay, it's great that we're going to show folks right portions and that they should have half their plates with vegetables and a lean protein, but what if we could actually tell them specifically, based on what we're serving in our restaurants, what they can eat that day and at that meal period and create the perfect plate based on what we're serving. So with the help of our dining analyst team, we we're using a Microsoft Access database and we imported our menus. So I can go in now and actually assign our foods to certain groups, certain food groups. So let's show you an example. The, the, the pasta, it's whole wheat, whole grain. So that actually satisfies the whole grain portion, portion of the plate. The Italian meatballs would satisfy the protein portion. So our menus, we realized, actually already have all the components of a perfect plate. And so what we're going to implement very, sh very soon and I'm going to show you where in a second, something we're going to call our plate, or today's plate, where we tell you how to create a very balanced meal that's also portion controlled. So for example, on April 24th at lunch in our residential restaurants, we were serving these items, wild rice, mixed green salad, grilled salmon, yogurt, and a fruit salad. And we're also telling folks where they can go pick up these items so they don't have to wander around our residential restaurants looking for where's the salad, where's this, where's that. We tell them exactly where they can find it and how to build the perfect plate. So it contains all of the food groups. And if you look here, those are the plates we actually use and they're about nine inches in diameter. So here's where we plan on displaying our My Plate campaign. We have these RTOC screens within our residential restaurants. This is the one that's just outside the restaurant. This is when you go uh, to pay uh, for your meal, and this is inside the restaurant here, and inside we have other RTOC screens. And so we plan on cycling today's plate throughout the day. It'll be different for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we plan on implementing this soon. So if you haven't seen it yet, you will. And we're going to test it in residential restaurants first, but we hope to extend that into the retail uh, our campus restaurants as well, to the re retail facilities. But currently, if you walk around our retail restaurants, you'll see that there are some uh, My Plate campaign uh, education pieces throughout. I'll show you some of those. And these would be cycled through the RTOC screens as well. So we want to continue pro providing that education. And these you'll see in our retail restaurants. Uh, one serving of rice or pasta that's been cooked is about half a cup. Uh, a serving or a cup of salad is about that much, and so on. Here are some of the other ones. You'll see these in the hub. Color your health. Uh, eat a variety of fruits and vegetables. Think about color when you're looking down at your plate. Choose whole wheat pasta because it provides you with more nutrients and it's higher in fiber than regular pasta. Choose healthy foods for your body and mind. Eat a healthy diet based on a variety of nutritious foods. So again, these would cycle through the RTOC screens and you'll see these as part of our stanchion toppers. In fact, this one is a topper at our La Fiamma, within our La Fiamma line. We also want to make sure we incorporate uh, different cultures, foods, and influences. In fact, our campus is so diverse, U.S. News and World Report ranked it 12th in the nation when it comes to diversity. So we want to make sure that the food choices reflect the diversity of our campus and our community. And in fact, Chef Rob here, pictured on the left, and Chef Charlie uh, won uh, gold and silver awards at the National Association of College and University Food Services Regional Culinary Challenge uh, these past couple years. And they really take pride in implementing other cultures into our menus. And in fact, the comments we've received have always been fantastic when it comes to food quality. And I wanted to show you a snapshot of just one meal period's menu. If you look carefully, you can see we incorporate a number of different cultures 
each, each day. You can see there's, of course, American food, there's Asian-inspired cuisine, Latin-inspired cuisine, Indian, and it goes on and on. The last thing I want to mention is some of our campus collaborations. Uh, in fact, with regards to just implementing Seeds of Change, we couldn't have done it without the collaboration of so many folks on campus. Uh, with regards to our faculty staff wellness program, uh, we've worked with them quite a bit to create um, some health and wellness programs for our, our campus and the community. The, la the one we began last year was something called Mission Possible. Folks who signed up were given a weekly mission, and they were sent a weekly mission by video. A mission could have been make sure you try and get at least seven hours of sleep each night or eat three servings of vegetables and two, serving of, two servings of fruit each day. And for each day they followed th that mission, they get a point. And then they tallied up their points and they, wrote, they received prizes and things like that. We had 192 faculty and staff complete the 12-week program last year. And so it was such a hit, we received such positive feedback that we were requested to do a sequel. So earlier this year, we created Mission Possible 2, and we almost doubled the amount of faculty and staff that participated. So 370 actually completed the 10-week program. We changed it to a 10-week program so that it coincided a little bit better with the quarter system. Also last year, uh, in October, we launched a program called Bounce into Wellness. With the excitement of basketball season approaching, uh, we thought we would capitalize on that and name our program after something basketball related. And it was a program specifically designed for housing, dino, dining, and residential service employees. 125 of our folks participated. It was very well received, and in fact, they're asking for a sequel to that as well. So again, some final remarks. Collaboration is key. Uh, we, we believe that this is a key strength for our, our programs here. We leverage all the wonderful resources at UCR and the UC system and all those resources they have to offer. Our programs complement each other perfectly and work together seamlessly. And that's really why we can launch something like Seeds of Change, is because of this ability to collaborate. We hope that the Seeds of Change initiative will transform the way we all think about food. Thank you. So we do have time for a few questions, and if you have a question, I would ask that you raise your hand and wait for one of our wonderful science ambassadors to bring you a microphone because this is being recorded. And I will ask um, either Cheryl or Neil to repeat the question before they answer it. So please, if you have a question, raise your hand so one of our science ambassadors can come find you. about the soil that you grow your food on. Well, so he asked, what about the soil that we grow our food in? So I know, at, um, as I mentioned, one of the things that we're doing, we, have a, we currently have a dehydrator that we use at Lothian, and it, it does a small amount of food waste and dehydrates it so that we can actually use that product um, over at the R Garden and, and put it into the soil, it's very rich. Um, and we're actually looking to buy a much larger unit um, in the next year or two that will do about 850 pounds of food waste. Um, and our hope is um, we're actually starting to do some tests on the product to see if we could use that same amendment um, over in our citrus orchard. And if nothing else, what we do know we can do is take it with our, our green clippings and mix it together and make a really rich compost. Question? Oh, the, uh, the yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. There's a question. Yeah. Hi, good evening. General question for uh, our two speakers. Are there any things that UCR students are doing faculty members um, researching, because we were very much in an urban environment and we have to nearly double food by 2050. And are there innovative, uh, is there innovative research that's being done that's, grow that's growing, looking at growing food in non-traditional methods here on campus? 
but you may be aware. I can answer some of it. Okay. Come I mean, on you guys can, but. So, so I can tell you one of the issues that growers throughout the state and, and other um, states that are experiencing drought are facing is an increasing amount of salt in the water that they have available to use to irrigate crops. And so we have many faculty on campus and in our college who are looking at finding plants that are food, you know, food growing plants that will tolerate the, those high uh, salty waters. We have other faculty who are looking at, um, st they study the response of plants to drought or study the response of plants to flooding conditions, uh, which also is relevant, maybe not in California lately, um, but in other parts of the world there, there are a lot of uh, uh, areas that flood all the time. And so we have a lot of faculty who are looking at finding ways that we can either um, breed uh, characteristics into plants that will allow them to grow in drought conditions or in flooding conditions or other kinds of conditions that, that are, are environmentally stressful for, for regular plants. So that's just one, one kind of uh, type of research that we're doing. I don't know if you have other. I don't know how many people attended our session, um, the, the last uh, session that we had on the, the cow pea or the black eyed pea. Yes. Um, but it's a really good example of how UCR is working to uh, ensure that we develop um, plants um, that in countries like Africa can really make a substantial difference in the amount of food that they produce. So they're, they're looking at how you take the best of all plants and mix them up together. Um, it's their science, not mine. I just cook it after they, they do it. Um, but I, I think there's a, a lot of information um, that's coming out of the UCR campus. And I certainly know if you've never been through our, a, a walk of our citrus fields um, with some of our very, very talented folks over there, I just learn a bunch of information about how we grow and how we make it um, richer, better, you know, more exquisite flavoring and just all kinds of production issues and things that they're researching. So uh, a great group to connect with. We actually have some here in the audience tonight. Uh, yes, do you have a policy about GMO products? We do not have a policy about GMOs on, on campus. Um, you know, I always say there's a balance. Um, so we, ha we actually have a number of people who are researching uh, GMOs on our campus. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting. I actually attended a, a recent meeting up at the Culinary Institute of America um, where they had um, a, a group of people actually speaking on GMOs. They had a, a, someone who was anti-GMO and, and it was really interesting. I learned more about GMOs than I, I actually had ever learned before and uh, discovered that it was actually from one of the people from UCR. So as a co-chair for the UC Global Food Initiative, um, our first traveling lecture that we want to put together um, to attend multiple campus is a program on GMOs because we think there's a lot of people who are really struggling to understand that concept and you know we feel like people need information in order to make the best decisions. And we do offer a number of products on the campus that don't have GMOs um, but we really haven't developed a position on it and wouldn't. Uh, pest control do you use as a chemical or do you have natural ways of doing it? Or the vegetables and fruits? Um, some of our products or, are organic um, but it isn't really a requirement so we we have um, organic and non-organic. Um, I think one of the things that we've struggled with in terms of organic is that very often they come at a, at a premium. Uh, organic practices um, don't really create the production levels that you would find uh, in normally commercially grown agriculture and so they're a little bit more expensive um, and for a lot of people they they truly don't want to pay the price when we can get them um, we do buy organics in in a lot of times when we source locally they come in organic so if you attend our community supported agriculture program that we talked about with farmer bob he actually brings in a mixture of some organic vegetables, but also some traditional.
So in the interest of time, I think we should thank both of our speakers for an absolutely a fantastic <laughs> series of presentations. I have to say, it's, it's, it's kind of embarrassing. I've been on campus for 27 years, and I had no idea of half of what was going on. This is absolutely wonderful, and, I, and I'm thrilled to hear about um, everything that you're doing and the involvement of students and the collaborations across campus, because as you said, that's the way things will get done. So I don't know about you guys, but there's some food at the back of the room, and I am sure that, that Neil and Cheryl will be happy to give us a little bit of a hint about what it is that, that we're going to be experiencing. So I don't know who's going to do that. Okay, thanks, Cheryl. So um, we actually tried to put together some samples of some of the concepts that you've heard today. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the things that we're going to feature today is a mixture of wild mushrooms, 40%, and grass-fed beef. It's made into a little bit of a slider for you. Um, but it's really amazing um, when you actually add a mushroom to um, a protein like beef. Not only does it increase the moisture content, it actually has the same sort of umami flavor to it. Um, it's rich, it's delicious. You really can't even tell that it's in there, except I think it improves the flavor. Um, we're also going to show you a, a salad that's made with olive oil, a local olive oil. Um, we've got spa waters to show you. You don't have to have those sugary beverages. And then we have our flip on a dessert, which is a really nice strawberry offering with just a sprinkle of cheesecake on top of it. So, you know, like I say, we're not telling you not to indulge. We're just telling you to think about it in a slightly different way and it can make an enormous difference on your health. So we wanted to show you some of those those items that we have available. There's a gazpacho back there as well and it's a Think Produce First item. Delicious. So um, please join us in the back of the room. Try some of these really great offerings and bon appetit. <laughs>